Well, it's great to join you here at TAMIST. And uh, what a great talk by Colonel Hamilton. Really uh, set the stage of all the opportunity of AI, as well as how to think uh, really judiciously about its application. And on the last point, uh, Jim, on quantum, I couldn't agree more uh, with Colonel Hamilton's uh, answer. The first impact on computing will be cyber. Uh, and we're already at AMD building uh, quantum resiliency uh, into all of our uh, defenses that uh, we have in our chips. Well, look, let's, let's jump in and, uh, and spend a few minutes. And I'll just uh, start with uh, uh, just a personal uh, anecdote uh, about uh, AI and what AI uh, gets its efficacy from, and that's data, and how it uh, is able to uh, put data to use. I'll go way back. I'll go back to my high school years. Uh, my dad was a professor of uh, immunology at University of Texas uh, Medical Branch in Galveston, and he introduced me to uh, who was the gentleman who was running the cancer uh, uh, data center at that time. So now you're going back to the 70s. So the PC wasn't even uh, out yet. But uh, it was Dr. Jim Hokinson, and he had really novel approach of gathering all the data of the uh, cancer therapies going on, amalgamating it, and analyzing it using the computing capability at the time. He was an electrical engineer. It shifted my whole thinking of engineering. Engineering can be used to solve so many problems, and it can be so impactful in medicine and medical research. And that's actually where my uh, career path got steered, was into engineering and computing, where I spent the last uh, four plus decades. And here we are today. I wish I was just beginning now, because what you're seeing is algorithms that are completely dependent on that computing capability, and they're able to do simply amazing things. I never dreamed of when I started my career. We're going to explore that a little bit. And if there's one thing I do, uh, hopefully what's done is I made a little connection to you as to what you can get done with your data and the dependency it has on the computing capabilities underneath. So uh, I mentioned that you know, it's, uh, you know, AI is so transformational. I, will just actually ask you to think just a moment of the transformations that you've personally experienced over the last decades. And uh, probably the first thing that would come to mind is, well, the internet, it changed everything. I mean, we used to do, uh, you know, go to the libraries and, you know, uh, get stacks of books and articles, publications, and, you know, research uh, was extremely uh, methodical uh, to just get the information to then ingest, analyze it, and fold it into your into your thinking. And the internet changed all that because it, it made uh, data accessible to you. So the first use of the, interset, uh, of the internet, uh, besides chat uh, functions, which took off uh, pretty quickly, was simply information availability. It fundamentally changed information availability to you. But now think about the internet. It's everywhere. It's pervaded every walk of your life. You, you, you don't even think about it. it it's a utility that you use. And that's the analogy that I'd make to you as to where we are with AI right now. It's still the very early days. Uh, we are just now uh, seeing applications that uh, are starting to uh, actually in, uh, affect our lives every day. So it's already uh, being used. Most of it uh, is fairly rudimentary. If you, you uh, uh, think about uh, natural language recognition. The accuracy is way up, uh, but it, it's, it's still got a long way to, to go to actually be natural, to actually be uh, completely fluid. And the accuracy needs must get much, much greater. We must eliminate what Colonel Hamilton was talking about. You can't have hallucination <laughs> that's going on in an application that you are depending on, like driving your car. Do you want your, you cannot have hallucination of an autonomous driving system. And I can obviously give you a dozen other examples. But one thing's clear, it's just not hype. I hear all the time, isn't this hype? I remind you of the internet analogy I gave you. Uh, and, and, you know, there's the same claims at the time, this is hype. Uh, so we are going to see nothing but continued improvements, uh, the accuracy, and then fundamentally, the computing capabilities underneath. Where are we today? 
the reason I say it's not hype is it's already changing the very innovation process that most all industries are running. That most of us, anyone that calls themselves a creator is already tapping capabilities, which are indeed game changing. We had a chance, to, I sat down with the uh, uh, CEO of Adobe recently and saw how the, the, this, the creative process of using Illustrator, creating creative content is changing. Is it, is it replacing those innovators, creating marketing uh, content? No, it's not creating it, but it's completely changing the innovation process. I show just a rudimentary example here of uh, you could give a, a voice scenario uh, in terms of what kind of image you're looking for and, uh, and just simply change out the backgrounds and what used to be painstaking, it takes hours, it takes days, is instantaneous now. Backgrounds are changed, images are changed, look up a vast library of content to tap and, and you can bring those ideas to life instantaneously. It is augmenting and fundamentally accelerating the innovative process. That's a simple example of creating a visual or, or a, you know, a, 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 an AV type of content. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a, a, a dozen more. It's the prototyping process is speeding up. When you think about digital twins, the ability to have a model, well, we've had models for years, these so test models, I'm predicting what's gonna happen next. But what does a digital twin do? It's taking data real time. So you're marrying a simulation model with the physical implementation you, is, and you're changing parameters on the fly and you're modeling and predicting the outcome. And so what used to take many iterations of a design process is now vastly sped up uh, using uh, much higher compute capability than we've ever had before uh, and AI for its uh, predictive capabilities, constantly learning as new data is acquired and as you tweak parameters with your associated process. So what I would remind you of is why did it take so long uh, for AI to come about? It, it was uh, 2011 and 2012 when uh, Dr. Hinton really showed the groundbreaking results of accuracy improvements in natural uh, language uh, recognition and image recognition. And the breakthrough was computing. Computing has been the gate. The algorithms have been developed over decades. It is math, as, Dr. as uh, Colonel Hamilton said. Uh, and the GPU, with its vast parallel computation versus a scalar CPU uh, is really a breakthrough uh, in terms of creating uh, the computing capability necessary. And so that is why uh, we've already seen CPUs and GPUs used for HPC, high performance computing applications. So the national labs have been probably the first to discover this combination of scalar and parallel computing. But as the AI algorithms, as the uh, recursive uh, algorithm of deep learning where you forward propagate the math, the multiply accumulate, the matrix function, and then you recursively adjust probabilistic weights, improving accuracy. That's the fundamental math under AI. And the GPU uh, proved to be uh, the breakthrough uh, that allowed us now to see vast uh, advances uh, in our AI capabilities. And I want to tell you that there was a fear. I had the fear. How are we going to keep computing on this inexorable pace? Moore's law says that the computing capability would double every 18 months. So that's a you know, very uh, highly nonlinear acceleration of, double, of doubling every 18 months. By the way, it would stay at about the same cost and the same power dissipation. And you've heard all, uh, Moore's law is dead. That, and so it, it drives new innovations in microelectronics and chip design. And that innovation is there. It is this heterogeneous compute. It's CPUs, it's GPUs, it's other accelerators. It's being very mindful of what I call holistic design, thinking of how to optimize the silicon up through the software, through to the, finally the application stack. So it's driving collaboration in ways you've 
uh, actually never seen, and I'll talk about this more later, but AI is breaking down silos of collaboration. That is what's driving innovation to not only keep us on this nonlinear Moore's Law pace of computing gains per generation, but increasing that pace. So I wanted to spend the uh, next few minutes on uh, a few examples. And uh, these are examples that I know because uh, as CTO at AMD, I get the opportunity, the pleasure, to be able to work with customers and see how are they deploying that chip technology? What benefits uh, are they able to, uh, to get out of that? And we'll start uh, with just a few. I'll start with uh, molecular biology. Uh, molecular uh, modeling labs uh, has been delivering some absolute uh, breakthrough therapies. And uh, the way that they're uh, able to do this, they're, they've chosen to use the cloud. They're using Microsoft uh, Azure. Uh, they're using uh, our AMD uh, uh, CPUs uh, along with uh, GPUs. And what they're uh, able to do is drastically reduce the simulation time. So think about uh, getting a new drug to market and modeling interactions and, and the physics associated with the interactions. Uh, they've now literally cut years off of their development cycle. The uh, next thing is obviously automotive uh, and the type of uh, capabilities that probably most of you have. If you have a recent make and model car, you're getting already a lot of, uh, of camera image detection. You might have autonomous driving. Uh, it's uh, the pressure it has on the electronics underneath is incredible. I don't think any, many people realize that until the pandemic hit <laughs> and then there was a shortage of the uh, very electronics these systems are, are dependent on. But your car has become a, a mobile computer. It's actually becoming a mobile supercomputer. And uh, we're very proud to work, uh, for instance, uh, Subaru, uh, their whole eyesight and all the uh, image stitching. Uh, we've worked with them close in the technology. Uh, we work with Tesla where the electronics underneath that whole information and entertainment uh, exchange you have with the big display in your, in your cockpit. Um, they have uh, uh, their own uh, autonomous uh, circuitry that they put in, and on and on. Every, every automotive uh, vendor is changing uh, how they design automobiles from the ground up. Uh, and Tesla uh, has been an innovator in actually uh, shaking up uh, the industry, no doubt. And then chip design, the world I live in. Uh, you know, is, uh, you, you have to be able to disrupt the way you do things or someone else will disrupt you. And we have certainly taken that approach uh, with our uh, chip design uh, efforts at AMD. So chip design, you think, is hardware development. Uh, it's actually as much software development, if not more, than it is hardware development to get uh, complex uh, uh, microelectronics out today. And what we did is we, we analyzed where's all the effort going into that chip design. It turns out two-thirds of the effort is actually in the test, debug, and fix process. Two thirds of the process is a triage. Uh, there might be uh, some analogies to that uh, in, in the uh, medical field, I'm sure. Uh, you, you might have some uh, similar uh, uh, statistics in the clinical applications. But it actually shocked us. We assumed, you know, until you really uh, analyzed all, all of where your time is being spent, you inherently think it's more in the design process. So, what have we done? We've, um, we've applied AI, for instance, on the software we're using. Uh, co-pilot capabilities. And so rather than coding everything from scratch, our software coders can, in natural language, uh, enter in what it is they're looking for. And that is a, a fundamental change about AI, is changing how we even interface with computing. It is a natural language interface. So you're describing, you're, you're changing your creative process to be an interactive one, and yet you're tapping a, a treasure trove of data. Uh, and when we do in, uh, in our chip design is we trained our own models. I'll talk a little bit uh, in a minute about how important it is to think about your data and your model development. Well, we've done that at AMD, so you can't uh, go out to chat GPT and have it design a computer chip because the data about how you would design a leading edge microprocessor is not public. That's what our cells, our, com our competitors, that's, that's what makes us who we are. We cannot uh, just share that to a large language model, it would, be, it would basically be giving your business away uh, to the world, and, and, and including global uh, uh, competitors. Uh, so we train our own model. Uh, we did that with our, our software. 
uh, and we are, are getting uh, excellent improvements in our efficiency on our coding process, and we do it on our hardware. When you think about the billions in transistors that you have to lay out to get this type of computation, uh, it is very much, a, uh, if you have the data, you can look at what was the best way to route and uh, place and route those transistors? How do you optimize that? And so we are able to tap the data that we have, build our own models, and fine tune them. And we're very pleased uh, to date uh, with the kind of progress we're getting. But on and on, uh, you know, I, I won't go through all these in detail, but, but healthcare, uh, we've been working, for instance, with Clarius. They reduced, re released in February of last year a mobile scanner uh, that, that can real time identify areas of interest uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sonogram and flag areas uh, to the, uh, to the uh, professional uh, that's running the exam. So it's, it's tapping that vast history of previous diagnosis uh, to on the fly, real time, identify uh, areas of potential danger. Uh, and obviously it's, it's that uh, analogy will extend to all of radiology. Radiology is fundamentally changing. It's not replacing radiologists, but it's tapping the vast data of every diagnosis that's been recorded and part of a, a database used for, lading, uh, for learning to improve the, the accuracy and reliability of those diagnoses. Uh, a number of other examples, but I'm gonna jump to, to research where uh, supercomputers now uh, are just providing an amazing processor capability. We're very pleased at AMD to have the CPU and the GPU uh, in the Oak Ridge National Lab Frontier System. It became operational about uh, uh, just over a year ago, it was late 2022. It's, a, it's an exaflop of computing. That's a, a thousand times a thousand uh, flops, uh, floating point operations. Uh, and you know, when I think about uh, starting my career <laughs> and uh, developing some uh, you know, earlier supercomputers, it's simply astounding uh, the uh, super exponential that we've gained in capabilities. And so Frontier is used uh, for uh, government analysis. It's also open uh, to industry. And just a, a couple of the examples uh, that are being used is one is um, in uh, climate analysis, uh, when you look at uh, convective clouds, they've been trying to model in weather accuracy uh, certain cloud structures. They've never been able to crack it. And with this type of computing capability, uh, they actually have been able to model and significantly improve weather forecasts. Likewise, GE uh, has used this capability uh, to improve the industry of the fan blades in their engines. And there's example after example. Oak Ridge has a, a website uh, that, you can, that you can click into. Lumi is uh, in Finland has a 13 billion parameter model. The, the model size uh, is a proxy for computing uh, complexity. That curve I showed you earlier with the double exponential, uh, that was uh, showing you the model size uh, increase that is getting this, this accuracy. Uh, and Lumi has uh, created uh, this uh, to, to create an LLM uh, in Turku, the, the language in, in Finland. And Allen Institute, has been using the uh, Lumi supercomputer and they've created an open source 70 billion uh, parameter model OMO. And so you're starting to see opening up of this capability for uh, not just the domain of those that are in a massive national lab or can get access to the computing in a mass massive national lab, uh, but uh, open source models that uh, can be proliferated. Uh, and other examples as well, leading up to El Capitan, uh, which we're standing up right now uh, in AMD. Uh, again, it's an AMD CPU and G GPU at Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab. Uh, and uh, that is gonna be uh, uh, creating an order of magnitude yet again, more computing capability. And what I'd like you to, to think about is uh, just the pace of this innovative process. It went from the domain only of supercomputers to the domain of hyperscalers, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle. Uh, and uh, now what you're seeing is, yes, those, th those are the domains still for the massive large language model that you need to create uh, uh, ask me anything 
uh, that's a chat GPT, a bard, that's ingested all the public information. Uh, maybe there's a little debate if it was all public, but it's, invest it's, you know, it's ingested all of the information available to it for a broad set of questions. But that's not good enough for what we need. If you think about any field, if you think about medical research, you need a model that's trained and tuned to your data. And so that's the trend that we're seeing. And that's what we're uh, seeing is that we need support for AI from cloud to edge to endpoint end user devices. And so that, you know, that um, uh, really takes uh, software and hardware collaboration because the model size has to come down. ChatGPT is a trillion parameters. It takes a vast roomful of GPUs and CPUs to be able to run ChatGPT. It, it's simply not possible uh, for uh, the vast applications that industry runs today. Most of it's run on-prem, on your own premise. Your data center at your university, your data center at your industry is where the vast amount of your computing is done. You can burst to the cloud. The cloud today is about 10% of the computing, and it will go up. Uh, of overall compute, it, it, it may go up as high as 50%. But uh, that will be for the largest tasks or where you, you need the efficacy of running uh, in a compute facility that someone else is maintaining and sure it has the latest and greatest uh, capabilities. Uh, but you will see, you are already seeing now uh, that uh, the, imp uh, the training of tailored models at smaller model size, and particularly the inferencing. Inferencing is running your AI application. It must move to a low latency, an immediate response on factory floors. It needs to be in that auto as you're driving. It needs to be in that drone that Colonel Hamilton talked about, and it's gonna be right in your embedded devices. It will be all around you. It's gonna be in your, your phones and your PCs, and it already is today. Uh, we've already, in fact, at AMD, and our competitors are doing the same thing, our AI enabling their entire portfolio. So we're uh, thrilled to have launched our uh, Instinct MI300, it's our flagship data center GPU for those largest uh, training and inferencing tasks. We launched it uh, December 6th of last year. I'll talk more about it in, uh, in just a minute. Uh, but we've uh, got uh, AI enabled across, of course, our CPUs where the vast uh, majority of inferencing is run today, uh, embedded devices through our uh, application of uh, Xilinx, and it's in uh, AMD PCs today. We've been shipping AI accelerated PCs with a uh, uh, inferencing engine that's highly power efficient uh, since last year. I'll stick just a minute uh, to talk about MI300 because it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing feat. Uh, this is that data center GPU. It takes NVIDIA head on. Uh, NVIDIA uh, is uh, uh, an, uh, an amazing competitor. They've done uh, great things in pushing uh, GPU technology forward, but industry needs competition. And so we've been very focused, uh, actually been working on our software stack uh, for over eight years, and this is our, our fourth generation of hardware. And we've now uh, brought competition squarely uh, to the highest level of uh, performance and GPU compute, uh, there, and you know, there's uh, two versions of this chip uh, that can uh, focus on both HPC, another version that focuses on, on AI uh, computation, but what's amazing is the technology. It's 200 billion transistors which are stacked vertically as well as horizontally. So I talked about Moore's Law slowing down and innovation needed to keep us on that exponential computing pace and being able to pack the density and to be able to stack vertically and horizontally using chiplet technology has been an absolute breakthrough. And the performance shows. Uh, so this is uh, inferencing performance and, and the speed of the response of our chip versus the competitor. Uh, and you can see that we indeed now have a competitive in in industry uh, for GPU computation for that heaviest lifting of AI tasks, inferencing and training. So, look, I just want to highlight as I, as I wrap up uh, how important it is to democratize AI, to make it uh, broadly available. And uh, what we are committed to at AMD uh, is an open approach. Our entire software stack is open, uh, and we've uh, created an open hardware ecosystem. We're standards-based, 
and we partner with many in the industry to create uh, these complex AI systems all the way to embedded AI applications. And it's something I urge uh, all of you to think about is how do you leverage AI to break down the silos as you, as you are trying to attack problems, you're gonna find that any one group, their data is insufficient. They need amalgamated data along with others. And they need expertise of others within your group that have already have implemented successful AI uh, to improve the productivity, to speed innovation. And so don't miss the opportunity. Leverage AI, uh, leverage an open software stack, and, and uh, we've got you know, plenty of testimonials of, of folks that have been able to use our open stack and grab the opportunity of what is staring you in the face right now. It can be a game changer in your productivity. It can be a game changer as to how you collaborate within your sphere and with adjacencies around your sphere to fundamentally change processes. Throw out some of your thinking of how you've done things before uh, and grab this opportunity. Uh, it, you, you look at the trends, it is expanding rapidly of use case. It is moving from the domain of cloud-based and supercomputer-based all the way to what do you have in your data center, uh, to your edge devices. Hallucination of models is being vastly reduced because retrieval augmented gener generation, RAG, and multimodal is a way of using not just one model that you have, but complementing that large language model with very pertinent data in a very automated way. So it's, it's driving accuracy up very, very quickly uh, in AI applications. So yes, be wary of, the, of your data sources, but look at the new techniques, being able to rapidly drive up the uh, accuracy. And I think healthcare is simply ripe for transformation. And it's about coming together on, on the data. Uh, and I know you're gonna hear uh, more about this uh, from Caroline uh, tomorrow. She has a, a whole thought of the mindset and culture uh, needed uh, in healthcare uh, to bring the data together, which is a fundamental uh, uh, foundation underneath to drive change. Uh, but if we do that, I'm, I believe uh, the medical industry can be fundamentally transformed. Uh, Jim, I know in your, uh, your, your two-day session uh, uh, coming up in, uh, in March, uh, you're, you're gonna have some great ideas coming in, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for change. Uh, let's embrace it, let's collaborate, let's break the silos down, it's an incredibly exciting future. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Papermaster. All right, we have time for a few questions. If you would like to ask a question, please approach the mic. All right, you won the race. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. This is such a fabulous presentation. Uh, I'm Shrav Gulapali. I work for Shell, and I'm a protege, so thank you, Tamist. Um, the question I had was, um, I think you mentioned, right, like with AI, especially generative AI, large language models, the amount of compute you need is very, very, very high, like an order of magnitude over mm -hmm. regular ML. What about the carbon footprint and sustainability and uh, a, stu a second part of that question is then, do you need LLMs and AI for all applications? It's a great question. And uh, Shell, you, you all are a leader in uh, computing, uh, so we really uh, enjoy working with, with Shell. So sustainability is fundamental. Um, we are uh, just now in the United States is the awareness really rising uh, as the uh, importance. But for Europe, uh, it's been a, a dominating uh, factor for uh, a, a number of years now. And, uh, purchasing computer, computing, and uh, I'll be very straight with you, that trend to combat the slowing of Moore's law uh, is driving the density of, of energy consumption very, very high. Uh, and you know, we're now looking at uh, that, that very module I was showing you is today uh, running you know, hundreds of watts, uh, but it's on a path for future generations to be a kilowatt, so it's a density now, it still turns out that the efficiency, the energy efficiency of computing is still going way up every generation uh, because we're, we're it's actually more efficient when you can consolidate that computing, even though the wattage of that compute 
basic device is going up, uh, the overall computing efficiency uh, is actually dramatically improving uh, generation over generation. It is that holistic uh, computing approach I described to you. So uh, it is using new transistor nodes. They're more efficient at every generation. Uh, it is uh, how we can use chiplet technology uh, to be more efficient. So every time you create more density and you bring those transistors closer, you're, you're, you're not wasting the energy talking to devices which are spread out. That, just that connection, uh, interconnection energy is quite high. And so you're reducing there. And the algorithms, it turns out that the math approximations being used uh, uh, are uh, fundamental in reducing the power uh, in these uh, AI applications. Uh, and I'm, I'm seeing it actually also in HPC. For instance, uh, oil and gas has replaced uh, many uh, traditional HPC applications with more energy efficient uh, AI algorithms. So look, it, it, it's front and center, uh, and uh, we are very, very focused on it. And again, that's why we make our, our software open source and why we drive collaborations. I think that's the only way uh, that we can make uh, the, the gains necessary in sustainability. Uh, but we're very focused on it. We put very public goals out in terms of our energy efficiency uh, gains, and, and we're uh, achieving them. And the, the second part of your question, uh, y you know, it's simply uh, already becoming visible to us that uh, AI really is uh, finding its way uh, into every walk of our, uh, our work and research pursuits as, as well as our home life. So I think uh, that, that trend is already there uh, and um, it, it, it's only going to accelerate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question, so please go ahead. Hi, great talk. Uh, this is Wen Yi Li from UT El Paso. I uh, actually have the same question regarding to the energy consumption, uh, but I see your sustainability statement. Um, I wonder if you actually have a, a goal, a number. Yes, that's a great question, Wendy. We, we do. Uh, we, we put a goal of a 30x improvement uh, of our uh, energy efficiency of AI computation, so heterogeneous computing, as I showed you, the CPUs, GPUs, other accelerators that, that are used by our customers for uh, AI computation. From 2020 to 2025, we've committed very publicly to improve 30x our energy efficiency. Uh, we're on track. Uh, the, the latest uh, supercomputers I showed you, uh, we actually plot our, our progress, uh, and so we're on track to that 30x goal. Uh, and uh, when we uh, achieve that uh, uh, next year, we're going to set the next goal uh, because it, it's just too important. Uh, if, we don't, if we don't publicly commit to goals, uh, and that's for ourselves and our partners, uh, we, we cannot uh, achieve what society needs us to, and that is the best energy efficient computing that we can possibly uh, design across the industry. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Thank Karen. You very much.